tonight on Reporting Scotland. The Scottish Government strikes a budget deal with the Green Party. It will mean extra money for councils and public sector pay. A suspended Labour councillor categorically denies making racist remarks to former leadership candidate Anna Sarwar. Scotland's fire service is accused of bypassing the union over a pay rise. Celtic chased two more players to add to new loan signing Charlie Masunda. We'll have the latest on transfer deadline day. Still making a big noise, Rathlock's Sistema Orchestra celebrates its 10th birthday. It got everyone like closer, we're all like a big family. I'm basically friends with like everyone that's my age or even older and we all just got really close. Good evening. The Scottish Government's budget has cleared its first hurdle after doing a deal with the Greens. It will mean an extra £170 million for councils and proposals to raise public sector pay will now cover three quarters of workers rather than just over half. Labour called it a grubby deal that sells Scotland short and the Conservatives complained about higher taxes. Our political editor Brian Taylor reports. Public spending, it's about this. And this, and this, but it's also about this. Campaigners meander along the disused railway line near Leavenmouth in Fife. They want it reopened. This is the largest settlement in Scotland by far with no railway line. You wonder why we're still waiting. Exactly, especially with the, the, the carbon and the pollution. No promises yet, but projects like this perhaps look more likely with the enhanced focus upon rail and low carbon capital investment. For the Greens, that was one of their key demands. You got a good budget deal by now, Secretary? I'm looking forward to the debate and I'm looking forward to tonight's vote. And the Finance Secretary, Derek Mackay, cut a deal with them. At the core of the agreement is an extra £170 million for local council services. That adds up to a real terms increase. And there's more funding for public sector pay, so that all staff earning up to £36,500 should get a minimum 3% rise. But the budget is also about this, your money, your income tax. There's a change today. The higher 41% rate will now kick in at a lower income of £43,431. That raises an extra £55 million. This government is delivering the best deal for taxpayers in the whole of the UK. So for our economy, for our communities and the well-being of our nation, I commend the principles of this budget bill to the Parliament. The Tories were unimpressed. Presiding officer, this is a budget that can be summed up in four words. Pay more, get less. It's a budget where the SNP have broken their promise to the taxpayers of Scotland not to increase income tax for those paying the basic rate. Scotland's communities have been sold short by the SNP and the Greens today. Patrick Harvey defended the deal. I urged the government to go further. But the progress announced today will make a meaningful difference in people's lives and in public services in every community of this country. Among those communities, the Northern Isles, an extra £10.5 million for inter-island ferries in Orkney and Shetland. That obliged the island's two Liberal Democrat MSPs to back the budget, while other Lib Dems voted against. Their leader blamed ministers. This is not the way for a government to behave, to pick off remote and rural constituencies for their own devices, and we will not play their game. In the vote, the deal held and the budget carried. Yes, 69, no, 56, there were no abstentions. The motion on stage one of the budget bill is therefore agreed. Well, let's go to Brian now. Brian, we saw congratulations to Derek yes. Mackay from The Boss. Does this mean the budget is signed and sealed? Jackie, there's another two stages of budget scrutiny to go. This is only the first vote in principle, but the deal with the Greens will stick throughout that budget process. That pat on the shoulder from the First Minister said it all. It's job done. So how will this budget ultimately be judged? I think we come down to fundamental economics and fundamental 
politics. Derek Mackay says that 70% of people will pay less tax than last year, 55% will pay less than in the rest of the UK. And he says that the, 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 the productive spending that's coming forward for the public sector, he says, will stimulate the economy and be advantageous more generally. The Tories say exactly the opposite. They say that 400,000 people will now be paying an extra £169 a year as a result of today's uh, changes, that's middle and, and higher earners, and that's on top of an addition to the, the tax burden more generally. They say that that deters, potentially deters, um, people with talent coming to Scotland. It adds to Scotland's tax burden, and they say that that is the opposite of what's required. What's required is a focus upon economic growth. You have there a presentation of two alternative approaches to the running of the economy in Scotland. I guess we'll only know who's right when we see how that economy develops. Brian Taylor, thank you. A Labour councillor has categorically denied making racist remarks to former leadership contender Anna Sarwar. Davy McLachlan, the leader of the Labour group on South Lanarkshire Council, was suspended by the party yesterday. Well, Katrina Renton has been following the story. And what did Ms McLachlan have to say? Katrina? Well, I did briefly speak to councillor Davy McLachlan earlier today. Yesterday, he was named to Labour Party bosses by Anna Sarwar. He said he'd been talking to him during the Scottish Labour leadership contest last autumn. Now, he claimed that Davy McLachlan said that Scotland would not vote for him and used a racially offensive term to explain why he thought this. Now, he issued a statement today, Councillor McLachlan. In it, he said, I categorically deny these deeply hurtful accusations. I am stunned and dismayed at the claim that I would say such things. And he went on to say that he will defend himself robustly in the party's investigation and in any actions that follow. He also said this in the statement, earlier in the campaign, I pledged my support to Anas, but later decided to support Richard Leonard. Anas will know this and would understandably be upset, he said. Richard Leonard, of course, went on to win the contest. Now, Mr Sarwar said that he challenged Councillor McLachlan at the time and claimed he described it as engaging in pub banter. So what's the procedure? What happens next? Well, of course, these allegations go back months and it only came to light on Monday when Mr Sarwar spoke to a newspaper ahead of launching a cross-party group on tackling racism and Islamophobia at the Scottish Parliament. He then gave the details to the Labour Party. The Labour Party have now suspended, as you said, Councillor Davy McLachlan. He will now be investigated by the party. And tonight, the Labour Party told me that they do not comment on ongoing investigations. Thank you, Katrina Renton. An eight-year-old boy has been charged after an incident involving a knife at an Aberdeen school. Police say it follows a lunchtime incident at a primary school in the city last Friday. A report will be sent to the Youth Justice Management Unit. Police are investigating whether the drug ecstasy was responsible for three people, including two teenagers, becoming ill at a concert in Glasgow. Police and ambulance crews were called to the O2 Academy last night after a 21-year-old man fell ill in the venue. Whilst there, two 16-year-olds, male and female, also became unwell. They were all taken to hospital where staff said their condition was stable but giving calls for concern. Scotland's Fire Brigade Union says it's bitterly disappointed it wasn't properly consulted over a pay deal which could see hundreds of jobs cut but wages rise by up to 20%. MSPs also raised concerns during an emergency question in Parliament. It's thought between two to 300 jobs could be lost as part of the deal, but the service says there will be no compulsory redundancies. Our correspondent Lucy Adams reports. Firefighters tackling the blaze that ripped through Cameron House in December. Fighting fires is traditionally what they do. But that's set to change radically over the next four years. They're being asked to take on social care, counter terrorism, and respond to medical emergencies. Their reward? A pay rise of up to 20%. We don't know yet where fire stations will close, but it's suggested that there'll be 260 fewer firefighters and there's still many details to be ironed out. John Finney. In Parliament today, there were questions about why the offer was sent straight to employees. This isn't an operational matter. Will you direct the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to adhere to these collective bargaining uh, procedures? When I heard Chris McLone, the head of the FPU in Scotland, on the radio this morning, I was concerned indeed to hear what he had uh, to say on the matter, but I was equally encouraged 
that nonetheless the FBU stands willing to get round the table and engage in discussions about transformation of uh, the service. It's not that anyone... The union's disappointed that the service bypassed normal protocols and is checking whether they've broken the law. We think it's been handled very, very poorly. You know, the normal accepted and agreed protocols, and we've, we've got a joint, you know, agreement to work together, you know, within the service and between the service and the Fire Brigade Union. Both sides are signed up to that, and that includes accepted protocols for consultation and negotiation. But the service says it will work with the union. We are going through the normal due process. We are sitting with our union colleagues week in, week out, talking, negotiating, thinking with them about future roles. That's something we're absolutely committed to doing and we will be doing that this week, next week, next month, next year because unless we work in partnership, we're not going to get the best value out of this. Given the recent public sector pay cap of 1%, there's questions from others. 20% sounds like a lot of money, albeit it's over um, a large number of years, so we may see other public service workers increasing their claims. Um, but we'll also see um, firefighters saying, what's this for? What does it mean for public safety? Uh, and what does it mean for the, role that, the vital role that we do? Let me know if you feel any pain. The idea of firefighters taking on more responsibilities isn't new. It's been trialled in different parts of the UK. But the question remains about how this new deal will work here and how many jobs will go. Lucy Adams, Reporting Scotland. The oil giant BP says it's made two discoveries in the North Sea. Further appraisal work is underway following initial drilling at the Capercaillie field east of Aberdeen and the Achmelvish field west of Shetland. If viable, they're expected to be connected to existing production platforms. BP's managing director for the North Sea says the recent rises in the oil price haven't had a bearing on investment decisions. The unions representing workers at the Bifab yards in Fife and Lewis say urgent action is needed to safeguard jobs and the company's future. In November, the engineering firm was saved from collapse, but there's still a big gap in its order book. Well, our business correspondent David Henderson is at the yard at Burnt Highland. For us, David, talks took place between management and unions today. Was there an outcome? Well, Jackie, the union representatives were called to the yard uh, this lunchtime to meet with senior managers here. And I can tell you that before those talks took place, there was deep concern about what was going to be said by managers because it's no secret here that management know it, the unions know it, uh, staff here know it, workers here know it. Uh, there is a yawning gap in the company's order books, which means that there is not enough work to sustain the 800 strong workforce here and at the two other Bifab yards through the spring and early summer. And the concern was on the part of the unions that uh, management might announce uh, plans for redundancies in a bid to try to limit costs. In the event no such announcement was made and in the event managers said they remained committed to intense efforts working alongside the Scottish and UK governments to try to find contracts to fill those gaps. It was good to hear the management saying that these three yards are together and they complement each other and it's important that we keep these three yards going. Uh, and that was good because we always had fears that there might have been something going on in the Arnish yard or whatever, but that, the management is absolutely committed to that. And David, as we know, Biofabric came close to collapse just two months ago. Is it likely, is it feared that this could happen again? Well, Jackie, uh, last time the, the company ended up in serious trouble, it was all because of a, a multi-million pound legal dispute that it was in uh, with, a, rive, with a, a fellow company working on a, on a contract. Uh, this time around, um, the issue is much more fundamental. It's really whether Bifab can, can, can secure enough work to get it through this lean period, uh, through until the summer, at which point there will be huge contracts up for grabs, which Bifab can grab a, a share of. Um, they'll face intense competition from European rivals, but here's the thing. In some ways, Bifab is too big to fail. 
because the Scottish Government want to see more green jobs, more wind farms and more jobs arising from those wind farms here in Scotland like these ones here. So we can expect intense activities be behind the scenes uh, to try to secure those jobs and to get BIFAB out of the danger zone. David, thank you very much. It's uh, 17 minutes to seven, a reminder of tonight's top story. The Scottish Government's budget passes its first hurdle after a deal is struck with the Green Party. And still to come, Scotland rugby head coach Gregor Townsend names the team he hopes will beat Wales in Cardiff in the Six Nations opener. Nursing leaders have welcomed a rise in the number of training places for students, nurses and midwives, but say a radical rethink is needed to tackle the severe shortage of nursing staff in care homes and rural areas. They say the differential in pay for staff in the care sector and the NHS is just one issue that needs to be addressed. Sally McNeil reports. The Erskine home in Renfrewshire is far from typical. Its residents are veterans and their spouses. Margaret Horsfield came here last year. A former nursing administrator, she's surprised at a general change in attitudes. The big thing that I have with that is the nurses don't get the respect. And not just nurses, all the professions in here don't get the respect that they deserve. Um, people can be very demanding. Rasheen Black told the health secretary she returned to nursing three years ago. She knows she's unusual, but she wouldn't contemplate working in the NHS. It's too process-driven, and it's, you don't get enough time with your, your patients. It's not encouraged. Um, in fact, when I was there, and that's a long time ago now, um, it was discouraged um, at times. It just wasn't what I thought my nursing was going to be. Across the NHS in Scotland, the vacancy rate in nursing and midwifery stands at 4.5%, with almost 2,800 posts unfilled. In the independent care sector, the vacancy rate is around 31%, one in every three posts needing to be filled by expensive agency staff. It's really, really very worrying. If we've got such high vacancy levels, that puts an incredible strain on the existing staff that are there as well. And if they get overstretched, then care can get compromised. And that's a real concern for the Royal College of Nursing. As she announced a rise of almost 11% in training places for student nurses and midwives, the health minister said a change of image is needed to make the care sector a place nurses want to work. We have to work with the care home sector to be able to make the uh, profession more an uh, attractive proposition so that nurses choose to work within the care home sector and we're working with them on uh, ways to do that uh, and also look at different solutions. The RCN says those solutions must include more teaching staff, and more emphasis on a career structure for nurses working in the care sector. Sally McNair, reporting Scotland, Erskine. A sheriff has ordered that the money from the sale of a supply ship that was detained in Aberdeen for more than a year should be released so workers can be paid. The crew of the Malavia 7 spent 18 months stuck in the city's port after the ship's former owner's business was liquidated. They were owed more than £670,000. A sheriff ruled today the money should be released immediately. It's hoped they'll be paid in the next week. The fourth road bridge is due to reopen fully to public transport from midnight. It will be used by pedestrians and cyclists as well as buses, taxis and smaller motorbikes. Local groups joined the transport minister on the bridge to mark this latest milestone. Rugby now and head coach Gregor Townsend has named his Scotland team to face Wales in the opening match of the Six Nations Championship on Saturday. It's been 16 years since Scotland last beat Wales in Cardiff and as Andy Burke reports, they believe they are ready to end that losing streak. Ahead of the Scotland team announcement here at Orium today, much of the focus was on key selection decisions in the front row and at scrum half. But head coach Gregor Townsend has thrown in a couple of surprises elsewhere in the team. Perhaps the most surprising name on the team sheet is Chris Harris. The Newcastle man's form this season, earning him a first international start at centre. The competition for the number nine shirt is fierce, and it's Ali Price who gets the nod over Greg Laidlaw. In the forwards, Gordon Reid's experience sees him selected at loose head, and Cornell Dupria lines up at number eight in a team Townsend believes is ready for the challenge that awaits him in Cardiff. We'll need players specifically uh, key leaders for us to, to step up and make 
make big decisions throughout the 80 minutes. Uh, and we, we've been really encouraged by the, um, the growth of leaders throughout our, our group. They're always very, very open games. I think this one will be even more open because obviously you've got Gregor who wants to play that sort of game. Uh, and that's the sort of game that Scotland have been playing in the autumn. They chuck the ball around all over the place. So a lot of tries. Um, quite who wins is, is, is another thing. Any Scottish title challenge will depend on improving what has been a poor away record. There was only one team that won away from home last year that wasn't um, in, in Rome. And that was done in the last two or three minutes. So every team's aware how tough it is to win away from home in this championship, uh, as are we. But we, we've got to go in there believing we can and, and doing all we, all we can during that 80 minutes to win. Scotland last won in Wales in 2002 when Townsend was still playing for Scotland. Now he aims to smash the Cardiff curse on his Six Nations coaching debut. Andy Burke reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Meanwhile, it's the day when football fans across the country are hungry for transfer news. At midnight tonight, the January transfer window closes. Now, millions have already been spent in England. So what about here? Well, let's cross to the newsroom where our senior football reporter, Chris McLaughlin, has been keeping tabs. What's happening, Chris? Well, in terms of cash, it's the land of the loan deal here. There's very little money splashing around compared to England, Jackie. That doesn't mean... There's no news, though Celtic are looking to sign Dundee defender Jack Henry and their goalkeeper Scott Bain. Bain, in fact, is on his way to Celtic Park as we speak. They've already brought in Chelsea winger Charlie Musonda on an 18-month loan deal. This is him at Celtic Park today, meeting the media for the first time. He comes with a huge reputation. A number of clubs were keen. So why Celtic? Clearly, because it's a team that plays that, that needs to win. Uh, and me as a youngster coming from Chelsea, obviously, it's the same type of pressure. Uh, that's the most important thing for me. Uh, I've got a manager that's you know developed a lot of good players who play now in big, big clubs. So yeah, I think it's perfect. Uh, it's a big club, massive club, and uh, a good manager as well. Now, elsewhere, Rangers have inquired about the Swansea striker Ollie McBurney. That's amid reports that their frontman Alfredo Morello is wanted in China. Talk of a £7 million fee. The rest are all loan deals. Hibs are looking to take Celtic Scott Allen on loan again. He's currently on loan at Dundee. St Johnston have brought in two midfielders. Kilmarnock have done business today. So too have Hamilton, Hart, Motherwell and Aberdeen. They're all hopeful deals can be done before the window closes at, mid at midnight. As ever, all the latest on the BBC Sports Scotland website, Jackie. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, someone who is going, the Dundee United chairman, Stephen Thompson. He's announced he's to stand down from the role. He took over the chairmanship in 2008 from his late father, Eddie, and his main aim recently has been to get United promoted back to Scottish football's top flight. He'll formally step down at the end of the season. Now, Scotland's first Sistema Orchestra is celebrating its 10th birthday. The Big Noise Orchestra in Ratloch is the oldest of four in Scotland. It provides free music tuition in deprived areas and is based on a groundbreaking project first pioneered in Venezuela. Laura Maxwell reports. It all started in Ratloch with just 35 children. Its aim? to orchestrate social change by teaching children how to play classical music. Modelled on the Venezuelan project El Sistema, here it's called... <laughs> Ten years on, and almost every family in this community has some sort of connection to the orchestra, whether they're on stage, supporting, or simply enjoying it. An entire generation of children in Rapluch has grown up with the big noise. We're all like a big family. I'm basically friends with like everyone that's my age or even older and we all just got really close especially going on trips as an orchestra it's almost as a family. I'm starting to study in the Royal Conservatoire in October and um, I'm hoping to well uh, yeah go through the performance course for that and uh, play with an orchestra but also teach as a uh, on the side. <laughs> It's opened up new horizons for the musicians. They've performed across the world, including Venezuela, where the scheme first began. And there was a special concert to open the Olympics in 2012, when the children played with the world-renowned Simon Bolivar Orchestra. The Stirling scheme has been so successful, three others have been added to the Sistema Scotland network in Glasgow, Aberdeen and Dundee.
You have to spend money to save money. And if you put money into this, this work that actually gives people resilience and joy and confidence, down the line, you won't have to spend as much money keeping them miserable. It's a no-brainer. Accompanied by their own big noise orchestra, the community here are hopeful for another successful 10 years. Laura Maxwell, reporting Scotland, Rapluch in Stirling. Well, let's get the latest weather forecast now from Judith. Thank you very much, Jackie. And it's a wintry forecast as well. Here's a picture sent in by one of our weather watchers. We did see some snow over high ground today and we will continue to see some wintry showers in the north. Now, there is a Met Office yellow be aware warning for both snow and ice across northern Scotland and a warning for ice further south as well. So there will be the risk of ice tonight as well, inevitably with the cold air. And we're looking at uh, strong winds in the north, reaching gale force at times, severe gale force over Orkney as well. But the showers become fewer and lighter for the west coast but plenty piling into the north falling in snow over higher ground as well but much drier and clearer in the south so you might get, uh, just glance that super moon tonight. As far as temperatures go down to around about the freezing mark if not just above. So a cold night and a windy night with two things to take from this and that's how tomorrow starts. Plenty of showers in the west now a slight shift in the wind direction into the northwest north really will mean things are improving for the south but in the north we keep those Strong to gale force winds, bringing in showers. Showers falling as rain for the Northern Isles, something brighter in between, and we'll keep those showers piling into the far north as well. More in the way of showers generally across Aberdeenshire, but any snow I think confined to the high ground or hills, certainly. But if we take a line, say, from the Cairngorms over to the Nevis Range, south of here, plenty of dry and indeed sunny weather, but with that cold northerly airflow, generally it's going to feel quite bitter, really. Now, as far as the rest of the afternoon towards the early evening is concerned, very little little changes we keep those showers going but during the overnight period the showers do start to ease and the wind ease as well although staying strong even gale force across that northeast corner so it'll be a cold night with a touch of frost then as we head to friday a welcome ridge of high pressure starts to build in from the west but initially across eastern scotland it'll be quite blowy with gales up towards that northeast corner the winds will ease one or two showers for eastern areas as well but again they'll die away then a lot of dry weather with good sunny spells and uh, not as windy either. That's your forecast, Jackie. Thank you very much, Judith. Now a reminder of tonight's main news. The Scottish Government's budget has cleared its first hurdle after doing a deal with the Greens. Labour called it a grubby deal that sells Scotland short. The Conservatives complained about higher taxes. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'm back with the headlines at 8 and the late bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news. Until then, from all the team across the country, good evening.